Hi hey there, me again, your friendly neighborhood humble stroke assaulter. So we're going to do a video today about um, choosing the right therapist or counselor for you, right? Because that, that can be a very daunting decision you may have to make. Um, I lucked out finding the therapist I'm using. It was referred to me by a friend. Um, and we'll get into more specifics about how that relationship started with my therapist, meaning professionally, not otherwise. So I'm in Canada, so I can only speak to the Canadian experience. I can't so much speak to the American or British or any other country. So in Canada, the regulation of trades or professions are done at the provincial level, not at the federal level. The only, the only trades or jobs that might be federally regulated would be certain things like the airline industry um, or air traffic control or things like that. Th those would be probably more federally regulated. But things such as a professional college or uh, regulatory body, that's handled at the provincial level. So things like the Ontario College of Social Workers and Social Service Workers, the Ontario College of Nurses, the Ontario Occupational Therapists College, College of Physicians and Surgeons, College of Psychologists, and the Colleges, College of Reg Registered Psychotherapists of Ontario, or CRPO. Um, anyone that's employed in the counseling field uh, and is regulated in the province of Ontario must belong to one of those bodies. Now, how does it work in your neck of the woods? I don't know. That's research you're going to have to do. So I... I'm not going to get into specifics on the state of Idaho or the province of Saskatchewan or New South Wales or England or Germany or wherever else, right? So, because when you get into the state specifically, they've got their own unique set of situations, which can change drastically state to state. So what might qualify you to be licensed in one state may not even be licensable in the state you're in, right? So that is something you're going to have to do the research. So in the mental health field, a mental health practitioner might be called a therapist or a counselor or a clinician. Um, some people might try to call themselves a life coach, um, which has even more spurious connotations. And I'll get into that in a little minute, right? Um, these, ter these terms are very vague. They're not that specific. They don't mean a lot per se. They don't say much about the person's background their education, uh, what education they have, what training they've had, what practicums that they've had to pursue, uh, what certification they have. So unless in the province of Ontario, you are a member of the College, and, College of Physicians and Surgeons, you do not have the legal ability to dispense medications. Uh, a nurse practitioner who's a member of the College of Nurses, may have some ability to dispense some medications, but not all. Uh, unless you have a doctorate, either PhD uh, or an MD, you do not have, at least in the province of Ontario, the legal ability to diagnose. You don't have the ability to go, you have this. So, again, that will change in your jurisdiction. So I'm going to ask you to do the research for your own locations. Right, whatever that may be. I, I honestly don't know. Right. So if you're going to start looking for a therapist, now, when we say therapist, right, what do we mean by that? Right. We could mean anything. Right. Um, you know, and in, in Ontario, you can't legally use the word therapist unless you're a member of the College of Registered uh, Psychotherapists of Ontario. Now, you could be multiple colleges. You could be a member of the College of Nurses and a member of CRPO. You could be a social worker, a member of the College of Social Workers, and a member of CRPO. So just because you're a member in one college doesn't exclude you joining or being required to join another college. And the term therapist, that could mean psychologist, that could mean uh, psychiatrist, that could mean um, social worker, that could mean a, you know, many things. So what you want to avoid are people that are very vague about the certification, right? So I'm a life coach, 
okay, great, you're a life coach. Um, technically, anyone can call themselves a life coach because at least in my province, there's no professional designation for life coach. It, it doesn't exist. Right? Now, you might be a life coach who's a therapist. That's all well and good. But if I'm just going to put a shingle out and say I'm a life coach, well, that's a great thing. So you got to remember there's a few things you need to know about when you go to meet your therapist. So my therapist, I'm not going to mention her name because I don't have permission to. Um, she was referred to me by a coworker. Uh, so when I knew I needed a therapist because of, I was having some post-stroke anxiety, possibly circling the drain on the post-stroke post depression, I made a phone call. I then, when I met her for the first time, she gave me her spiel that she's required to give, um, both to satisfy her legal requirements uh, through various pieces of legislation, but her regulatory requirements through the colleges she belongs to, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, I asked her questions. I was very specific about questions. Like, one, uh, have you done any work at all with stroke folk? And I knew emphatically, if she was going to say, I have no experience working with stroke, um, I'm, I'm done. Right? You were, I'm going to bid you good day and we're going to call this what it was. Um, you know, she was unable to tell me that she used to work at the hospital that I go to for occupational therapy and physiotherapy. And she knows my physiotherapist, right? Um, which I then confirmed with my physiotherapist later that day or the next day, right? Um, so you also want to ask them questions like, what's the scope of your practice? Uh, where did you go to school? Uh, do you have more than one diploma or degree or certificate because education and mental health doesn't stop just because you got a doctorate in social work two years ago doesn't mean that the social work industry and its body of knowledge stays static just because you have a master's in counseling psychology from five years ago doesn't mean that the information you learn stays static this is a very fluctuating field so you're going to have to make sure that, you know, you're going to ask them, hey, where did you go to school? What's the scope of your practice? Some people don't work with families. Some people don't work with children. Um, you know, some people only work with couples. Some people don't. You know. So you're going to want to make sure you understand the scope of their practice. You're going to want to make sure that their education, you know, the, the certificates they hold, the diplomas that they have, make sense to your situation. Right now, you're going to want to make sure a couple of things, right? Do you have experience working with the issues I'm about to bring to the table? If they don't, probably not the best solution for you. Is that experience you have working with the situations I'm about to bring to the table? Is that an inpatient basis or an outpatient basis? Right? Um, are they able to explain? what they plan to do with and for you and how they intend to get there. So uh, once my therapist had done the getting to know you spiel and gone through the legal requirements that they had to both for legislative and regulatory things, she outlined, well, we're going to try this or that. And it was two different styles of therapy. And we talked about which would be the more, more beneficial. And her and I came to an agreement. We'll try this one, not that one. And, that's how we came to that conclusion. That was a discussion that her and I had together. Your therapist, again, I'm using therapist as a very vague term, right? Doctor, psychiatrist, social worker, whatever. Your therapist should then be able to give you, you know, well, I've worked with, like when I asked my therapist, how many people that have had a stroke have you worked with? She literally said, I can't figure out that number because she was part of the stroke team in the hospital where I live um, for a number of years. So she honestly couldn't give me a definitive number in that moment. But as soon as she said certain things, I'm like, aha, you do know what you're talking about. I, I think I can trust you with myself. Okay. Um, so they should be able to give you some relative benchmarks on how long I expect this to take, uh, what the benchmarks of, you know, quote unquote success look like, um, 
you know, what we need to be vigilant about, things of that nature. And then for the first maybe two to four, two to five sessions, they're feeling you out and you're feeling them out to make sure it's a right fit. Because you may not be the right fit for that individual and they may not be the right fit for you. Uh, because everyone has their own unique set of baggage that they bring to any situation. Um, and if you've had a stroke or a brain injury, be it acquired or traumatic, and you need to go to counseling for anxiety, you need to go to counseling for the depression, you need to go to couples counseling, you're, you know, think you're having the PTSD, you know, you've developed an addiction, um, you now have some kind of social anxiety issue uh, because of your, the complications due to your stroke, or brain injury. Um, so you may need a therapist for one of many situations. So you want to make sure that the level of engagement between you and your therapist makes sense. Like it's very, ultimately when you go to your therapist, it should feel like just a conversation. Although that's my opinion. Um, having had worked in mental health, um, Therapy shouldn't feel like an interrogation. Your first one or two sessions might feel more like a job interview because really they're interviewing you to make sure you're a right fit for their organization and you're interviewing them to make sure that they're a right fit for you. So the first couple of sessions might sort of feel like an interview, but after that it should just feel like a conversation um, and you shouldn't necessarily feel um, you know threatened you shouldn't necessarily feel angry you shouldn't necessarily feel on edge granted topics of conversation might be uncomfortable right that that is what therapy is there for it, it, it's to help you find the levels of discomfort and figure out new ways to work around it so you want to make sure that that fit with your, with your therapist makes sense now, just because you're in therapy doesn't mean you check your rights at the door, right? So you want to make sure that your therapist is accurately representing their credentials, their qualifications, their education, their experience, their competencies, and their affiliation accurately, right? That they are not pulling wool over your eyes, that if they make a claim, it can be substantiated, right? So if they, they claim to have the magical whatever, like I've got the magical elixir that will cure your depression, or I've got the magical elixir that will fix your social anxiety. Well, I'd be a bit skeptical about that. Okay? Um, I've seen people on some of my Facebook support groups try to call themselves a life coach. Uh, and when I ask them, hey, if you're going to say that you have the ability to be a life coach, please tell me about yourself. And they immediately got defensive. Well, if you're going to get defensive about someone calling your qualifications or your treatment methods um, or your education uh, or anything to do with a professional practice, if that individual is going to get defensive about their professional practice, I'm, I'm going to say avoid them. Right? Because if you're going to make claims about abilities or competencies or expertise when you deal in the humanities, be it a social worker, be it a nurse practitioner, be it a psychiatrist, be it a psychologist, be it anyone that is in the counseling field, if you're going to make these magical claims that I can fix you, I'm going to say you need to avoid that person. Now you have rights as a patient, right? Just, just like you have rights as if you were in a hospital. You have, and, and some of these will change dependent on your jurisdiction, right? So first off, let's just talk disclosure and privacy. In the province of Ontario, the basic rules of disclosure and privacy are this. One, provided I don't tell my therapist I intend to hurt myself, she can't tell anyone about that conversation. Two, provided I don't tell my therapist I intend to do physical harm to somebody else, she can't tell anybody about that conversation. And provided I do not appear to be genuinely psychotic, meaning I'm, I have no orientation in time, place, or person, I have no idea who I am, where I am, what I'm doing, 
she can't call anyone about that. That's, that's generally the rules. Um, and provided I don't have a conversation that says, I intend to put someone else in a position of risk, I don't, I intend to put myself in a position of risk, or if I'm clearly not in my right faculties, unless there's something else comes up uh, that your therapist indicates, those are generally the rules to privacy and disclosure, right? Again, please research what it is in your local jurisdiction, but then again, your therapist, when you begin that relationship, should be telling you. So, your first right, you have the right to participate in your plan of care or your treatment plan, whatever they choose to call that. So, um, and you have the right to have an individualized plan of care or treatment plan that is specific to your needs, your goals, your culture, your education, your language, anything that would deal with what we might call a protected status, um, you know, uh, be that your sexual orientation, your sexual expression, be it your religious practices, be it your lack of religious practices, be it, you know, you don't speak English so well and you prefer services in Italian or another language, right? Your therapist should be able to explain exactly what they intend to do in that treatment plan. If they cannot sit down and have a conversation with you about the plan, and this is exactly what I intend to do, and this is the methods we're going to use. We're going to use cognitive behavioral therapy. We're going to use... Um, eye movement rapid desensitization we're going to use um nlp like whatever the method they choose to use no. you have the right to object or terminate treatment it's that simple no i'm not doing that i'm done with you you have the right to do that you have the right to, to object to and terminate treatment. So your therapist can never say, but I'm the only one. Well, great. You might be the only one in your opinion, but I'm choosing to leave you, right? You have the right to access your records, right? So if someone's keeping records about you, you have the rights to those records. Now, again, there will be both federal and in Canada, provincial legislation and other places will be federal and state legislation. Um, you'll have to refer to exactly what that says on how you obtain those records, but you have the right to those records. Um, you have the right, again, to be treated appropriately in a clinical environment and receive treatment that is directly intended to help you with your needs, that is done skillfully, skillfully safely, humanely, and administered with full respect to your dignity and personal integrity. So at no point should you feel personally jeopardized. You have the right to be treated in such a manner that you're not abused or discriminated or you're not exploited or mistreated. So, um, your therapist may choose to use you in a case study. Your therapist may choose to use you as a case study they're going to present at a conference. But they're going to get your consent, right? Um, and you're going to sign a form and they're going to scrub it of any personal information and they're just going to say, I treated a male who's between 45 and 55. He, you know, was 48 years of age when he attended my practice. He presented on a self-referral because of um, psychological issues of stress and anxiety and possible depression after a neurological event being a stroke. And, and really, that's how they're going to present you. They're going to present you very... Um, anonymously, they will give specifics, but they'll give it in an age range. Like, so no one will know it's you, right? So, and then again, your therapist is going to give you very specific, informed consent that uh, your case interests me. I think you're a good learning opportunity. I would like to use your case at a conference coming up that deals with relevant subject matter. Will you allow me to do that? And if you say no, great. You don't have to say yes, right? Again, we've covered this a little bit. You have the right to be treated appropriately to your cultural background. You have the right to be given privacy. Now, we've already discussed the privacy and disclosure options. But what I mean is you have the right to be in an office with a closed door so no one can overhear the conversation except someone that needs to. You may be in a practice where your therapist is supervising placement students. And your therapist will have to tell you that individual is a student. 
If you don't want them here, they don't have to be here. Right? You have the right to report a grievance. So if I feel that my therapist has been an umpty, and no, you haven't. So if you're watching this, you're amazing. You're great. But if I was to think you had been an umpty, I have the right to report you to your supervisor. And in the case you don't have a supervisor because you run your own private practice, I can run to your college and seek redress of grievance at the college level. Um... I have a right to be informed of expected results. So if you're going to tell me that we're going to do um, eye movement rapid desensitization and we're going to do that for at least six weeks and you expect me to come in once a week for six weeks, you should be able to give me a benchmark of what you expect to get out of it, approximately when you expect to get that result. And you then should be able to tell me any adverse side effects or, or triggers or anything that might be negative that I could experience because of that therapy. I have the right to, to change the therapist. So if you're, if you're in an inpatient setting and you're seeing a therapist and you're just not getting on with them, you can go to anyone. So like, they're not touching me any again, like, no, get them away. Um, if you're in a private practice that has multiple therapists, you can ask to change and worst case scenario, if they're unable to, to facilitate the change, you can choose to terminate, right? like we're done. Um, you have the right to have another clinician, right? another therapist, review your therapist's work. You have that right. You have the right to keep your records to you. So if your therapist wants to refer you to a specialist, you have the right to determine what records get released or not. Right? Um, you know, like, for example, if I need my therapist to give my family doctor information because I need a psychiatrist, uh, well, definitely I would say, hey, listen, you can give them the information, give me the formal sign it. If I just want to go to my family doctor and say, hey, listen, I need a psychiatrist, again, I can do that on my own, right? Also, if you're dealing with insurance companies, um, they may want your therapist's information. Right? You may want to limit what the insurance company gets a hold of. So, now these are just generalities, right? When it comes to your specific local legislation, your specific national legislation, the various colleges that facilitate the licensing and regulation of doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, nurse practitioners, um, social workers, so, social service workers, um, psychotherapists, therapists, whatever they are, they're called. Again, that's where you're going to have to do the research, what's available in your own area, um, and what the legal standards are in your state, province, or whatever the case may be. I realize choosing a therapist is a very difficult thing to do. Because in some cases, you almost have to admit to yourself that I'm not able, I'm not capable to handle what I'm going through on my own. And I now have to surrender part of myself to someone else for them to help me pick up the pieces. There's nothing wrong in admitting you need help. There's absolutely nothing wrong in that. It's difficult to come to that decision. But once you have, it's actually easy to follow through on. The other problem is we tend to go to a therapist and just like, I need a therapist and you're going to be it. I wish I tried to find it, but I couldn't find it on the internet. Um, there was a study done a number of years ago that basically said people spend more time researching their next car purchase than they do researching their therapist or looking for a therapist. So it all depends on what you need the therapy for. It all depends on in some cases, your funding model. So if you're being funded through uh, your workplace group insurance, well, that's you might hit a funding cap through a year. If you're being funded through, say, uh, like workers' compensation, that probably has an unlimited cap. If you're going through some kind of insurance claim due to your stroke, that might have a cap in and of itself, right? So the funding model might dictate how much therapy you get or don't get. Right. So it all it all depends. Uh, and, and that's another thing. One of your rights, if you're going to see a therapist, you immediately have the right to know exactly what 
the fee schedule looks like, right? And for those of you that may not be able to afford the full fee, you might want to ask your therapist, do you take what's called sliding scale, right? Hey, you know what? I appreciate the fact that you're $140 an hour. I ain't got that. Can we maybe work something out, right? Like, can, can, can we work with 100? Can we do 100, right? Or they, they may be able to work something out for you. They may not. Um, that all depends. They may be in a practice where they have um, students, and they have students that are being supervised. So you may be able to see the student for a lesser amount. And again, that's a decision you will have to make. So, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying if you trust the individual that's going to be doing the work with you, why not? Right? If they seem like they're switched on, they seem like they're knowledgeable, they seem like they're educated about the situations you're going to bring to the table, if they seem like they can creatively and constructively contribute to your situations and make your life more manageable, why not? Right? And then, again, the big thing I always look out for, and this comes from my experience working in mental health, both on an inpatient secure psychiatric facility uh, and a outpatient basis, uh, in a in residential group home basis, uh, both with young offenders and in Ontario, it's called the Children's Aid Society, uh, and working with one-on-one um, -on -one as a support worker, historically for people with an acquired brain injury or a traumatic brain injury. Anyone that wants to say that I've got the magical beans, you know, I've got I've got the cure. I'm the only one that can do this. Well, no, that that's that's not the case. There, there are no magical cures in mental health. There are, there are no magical beans that you can take in mental health. You, unfortunately, when you finally make the decision to get into therapy because you've decided for whatever reason your life has become a bit unmanageable and you need some help putting those pieces of the puzzle back together, therapy has a potential of being a lifelong thing therapy you know just to just to get brief intensive therapy done could only be 12 sessions could only be eight sessions could only be six sessions so that's just your brief intensive that's just enough to give you enough coping strategies to get through the really shit days but to do the hard work can take months you know um years lifetime and that all depends on the situation it presents and i'm and i'm not trying to to draw any conclusions about anyone's situation and, and what it may or may not take for you to get what you need out of therapy so ultimately if you're going to look for a therapist make sure you're finding the right therapist that's the right fit for you that your the therapist is able to clearly demonstrate that they have experience education and expertise in working with the the situations that you're bringing to the table and that they're able to clearly create in concert with you uh, we call it a plan of care or a treatment plan that outlines specific steps that we're going to use specific models of, of uh, intervention techniques whatever that needs to be in your specific case that we are going to be able to see certain types of results when we expect to see them roughly in a certain timeline and there is a potential because we'll be digging at, so to speak, the uh, the psychic scab that we might, you know, need a couple band-aids here and there. So, in that event, if you find yourself in a situation where you believe that you you need to go to therapy, right, just do it. Right, um, find the right therapist for you. Make sure they're the right fit with you. Uh, partner with them, work with them, and eventually. They're going to give you difficult work to do. Um, but if you do the homework, because you're going to get homework, it's helpful. I've been there. On that note, if you happen to like what you've been watching the last, you know, coming up on 10 months in a couple of weeks, please like, share, subscribe. If you um, want to get the notifications as soon as a video is uploaded, hit the little bell to go for the dingy, dingy, dingy. And for those of you that are either in your own post work journey or supporting someone that's going through their own post work journey, Please like, share, subscribe, point the video out to someone, point the channel out to someone because they might get some benefit out of it. Um, and if you happen to see someone who's, you know, going through what looks like the signs and symptoms of a stroke, someone who appears to be befuddled, confused, unable to maintain their balance, they don't know where they are, 
Uh, someone who's having uh, vision problems, they see in grayscale, they can only see out of one eye, they can't move their eyes in a certain direction, they only see a little circle of the world. Uh, someone who's having facial droop. Uh, someone who's unable to raise both arms equally effectively or at all. Uh, someone who's having slurred, stuttering speech, inappropriate word usage for situation or context. Someone who can't smile equally effectively or at all. Um, Someone who can't maintain their own body weight, has general body weakness, weakness on one side, please immediately place that person in a position of comfort and dial 911. Something so simple can save a life.